Hello, and thank you for choosing this Analyst Insight podcast from the Information Security Forum. Hello to our regular listeners, and we have an increasing number of those. I hope we are continually surprising and entertaining you. Uh, Welcome also to listeners who are tuning in for the first time. Keep coming back, as we have a very varied roster of subjects to tackle over the next few months. Thanks to everyone for the continued support. To be honest, we've been a bit surprised to how fast our audience is growing, but that's a good thing. Tell your friends, tell your colleagues, and send them a link, maybe, but don't make it look like a fish. Uh, We don't want to be responsible for any of those incidents. Thank you. Uh, We're trying to make these podcasts as diverse as possible, so if there's an issue you think we should pursue, if you've got questions and comments on what we have already covered, let us know. We are getting emails, so many thanks for getting in touch. Um, I think we're we're talking to the people that have been uh, contacting us. Um, Yeah, so we'll deal with those in future episodes. Uh, contact details from myself are on the audio boom page where every episode is now available. But this episode is the second in hopefully will be quite a long running series looking at information security careers. Uh, we're going to be doing a few podcasts exploring particular jobs, roles, pathways, you know, how they change as people build up some uh, expertise. Today, uh, we're looking at security testing, um, penetration testing, and we're talking to a few people who do that for a living. My name is Mark Ward. I'm a senior research analyst at the ISF. And though I was a journalist for many years, I do feel like I could have ended up as a security or penetration tester, given uh, different circumstances. Um, Because as a journalist, um, I did a bit of hands-on hackery. I knew my way around Kali Linux for a while. um, And I cultivated a lot of contacts in that sector. Uh, I got some great stories from it as well. Um, But also here to help guide the discussion is Barrett Thackeron, a former CISO and now a principal at the ISF, who has done the hard work to pull this series together. So thank you for that, Barat. Hello. Hi, Mark. Uh, It's a pleasure to be here, and it's going to be a pleasure talking to our guests, uh, focusing on career pathways in pen testing, security testing. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, we've got um, some great guests, and they they had slightly different um, routes into this as a career, but yeah, there's some, um, yeah, but worth definitely going to be interesting to explore that. So to go around those, um, we have with us Alex Miller from uh, professional services company Mazar. Hello, Alex. Good to have you here. We have Barney Muller, who is pretty new to the field. Hello, Barney. And also we have Glenn Wilkinson, who has been doing this for a while, haven't you, Glenn? Good to have you. Hi, Mark. Yeah, it seems I'm the granddad of security in the room. Definitely. I won't tell you how old I am because... Uh... Uh, that would be uh, giving away too much information. But um, just to start off then, um, Barrett, if we can talk a bit about sort of what the heck is security testing and penetration testing. So because is it, uh, I just, yeah, I suppose as well, talk a bit about why we're doing this series because there's, um, I suppose the reason is we want to demystify it a bit because I, often yeah. when I talk to people, they kind of fall into the field and given more information, they might be here quicker. Yeah, I think, um, Mark, it came about, well, I was doing some work for the UK Cybersecurity Council and one of the areas they were grappling with was obviously the skills crisis, you know, more particularly in our field in, in cybersecurity. And one of the aspects that they found challenging was that it was very difficult for newcomers and even people in the field to find pathways, you know, find how to navigate this space. And often the discussion was around, well, I'm not quite sure whether I need a certification to do a particular job or uh, do I need a degree? And how many years experience do I need if I wanted to go from a intermediate level to a more senior level? And many, many questions around this. And so they started putting some information together for pathways. But I think it's still an area that really needs uh, help. And so I think, you know, if ISF uh, can assist with, uh, resp- you know, doing our bit to respond to the skills crisis, um, I think it'll make a difference. And so I think it's becoming increasingly uh, more important now. So, uh, no, it's fantastic to have our guests. And perhaps we can um, start with Glenn. Glenn, look, give us an overview of the security testing sort of landscape and pen testing uh, within that. Where, where are we and sort of how is, uh, how is it developing at the moment? Yeah, excellent question. Where, where are we and how did we get here? So. Yeah. Depending how far back we want to go, I'd say the maybe the '90s, late '90s, mid '90s is a good place to start. Um, when back then there wasn't really this idea of pen testing, but the notion of modern day hacking was really getting its footing. It was kind of the heyday of hacker groups, you know, all those funky acronyms: the Legion of Doom and Loft and uh, Masters of Destruction, um, and those those types of groups. 
And back then, hacking was mostly almost like graffiti, like spraying graffiti on the side of a building just to uh, kind of show off your skills or look at security. I think it was maybe in the early 2000s when there was a big migration of enterprises going online and having their core business operations online that the, this almost secondary part of, uh, of hacking came to be where it was to a degree financially motivated by the criminals breaking into networks to maybe steal information or, or get a hold of data. And at the same time, we kind of noticed, well, on the flip side of that coin, the good guys who just enjoy tinkering, we could start doing that kind of hacking. But as we say, for good, try and try and uh, break in to show you where your weaknesses are. I often describe it to people who aren't familiar with the industry as, um, we say, as uh, ethical hacking. Um, it's almost like hiring an ethical burglar to come and break into your into your home to show you where the weaknesses are. Because burglars generally have a different viewpoint and a different way of approaching um, security. The guy who installs the alarm is probably very good at certain things. The guy who bypasses alarms and breaks into things probably has a, a different viewpoint as well. I think that's where, where this the idea of pen testing first started taking off. It was much harder back then. So I, I got into this into this field, I guess, the late um, the late noughties, so 2008, nine ish. And back then it was, I guess, getting traction, but it was still quite difficult to go to, uh, go to a bank and say, Hey, I'm offering some services. Do you want to pay me to, to hack into your bank? And back then yeah. you got you know, pretty funny looks. It was, it was quite a hard sell. Whereas today it's, you know, it's standard procedure. Everyone from the janitor to the CEO, to the CEO knows that you know, security testing is uh, as much part of any business, um, as you know, HR or, or, or finance or something. From my point of view, it's, it's definitely evolved and matured, and it's it's a uh, it's almost a you know a, a well respected, well known career path now. It was kind of a bit more uh, fringe um, back in the back in the earlier days, um, mm. but I would definitely say now it's yeah it's established, and um, there's definite avenues to get better avenues to choose this as a career path. There's a lot more guidance, a lot more resources, and I think thanks to you know, podcasts like this and wonderful people like Bharat and Mark helping people get into the industry, a lot easier for people to choose this career path. Yeah, because I think, I certainly feel as a journalist, I remember writing in the 2000s about, well, obviously the dot-com boom, and that spurred a lot of people to, because it was, it was suddenly money at stake. So they had things that they had to protect, um, but you also got the DDoS attacks and Yahoo and things around there as well. So there's a lot of cybercrime really took off around that. So interesting that this, I'm going to guess, understandably, why this took off at the same time. Just to ask, uh, in terms of entering the field, Glenn, you know, and then we'll come to Barney, um, would you say that there are two or three sort of core areas or core entry points? Uh, pen testing might be one, uh, security analyst probably is another entry point, but beyond that, you know, um, it, it, you, you have to actually go through those routes in order to get, you know, something like threat ana analyst or architecture or something like that. Is that. Would that be the right way? Yeah, I, I think broadly speaking, there's, do you like breaking things or do you like making things? So are, you, are you an anarchist or an engineer? Um, if you like breaking things, then the pen test route is for you. Like that's that's your bread and butter. Just break, 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 break. Like cu curiosity and tearing things apart and that kind of a it's like childhood curiosity. And that's that's for some people. Other people prefer to make things. How, how can I build a secure environment or how can I... Uh, ensure that things are, are defended and, and, and well looked after. So I think those are the two broad routes to, to um, get in the industry. And then once you figure out which route is more appealing to you, then maybe you break it down in terms of, yeah, like, like you say, maybe it's uh, sitting in a SOC or threat analysis or uh, maybe even a, you know, DevOps security um, or holding secure applications or that kind of thing. On the other side, it's, okay, I like breaking stuff. Well, do I like breaking networks? Wi-Fi networks or you know, wired networks or cellular networks, or do I prefer reverse engineering applications, um, or do I even you know, even do, more? Uh, Glenn, can I ask? Do people tend to specialize then because you can't break everything, or you can't know about everything to break everything? So people tend to yeah, find yeah, definitely. So find I the mean, thing. there are definitely some hackers out there who are just good at everything and it's super annoying. But generally, <laughs> most of us are kind of good at one thing in particular. I think right. a, a really good quality of any good hacker is curiosity. So we, most yeah. of us know a little bit about everything, or at least appreciate the, the stuff that we're not that good at, but be super curious. And we can, uh, I think we could read a report or something on, on any anything in the field. If I'm not that hot at reverse engineering, I could definitely go and read a report on the latest reverse reverse engineering. But yeah, there, there definitely are specialists. I think there's almost hyper-specialization these days, which you, I think you find in any discipline where it becomes sufficiently mature. You, know, you go back two or 300 years, a scientist, 
you everything, right? I'm a scientist, I'm a botanist and a physicist and a chemist and all the science. These days you're a molecular biologist focusing on one specific super niche thing. And it can be the same with security these days. You can be a, a security researcher focused on reverse engineering, focused on a very specific uh, CPU architecture and a subdomain of that CPU architecture, which I think is right. excellent. It's just showing how, how far we've come and uh, yeah. how mature we are as a, as a, as a field. So let's ask uh, someone who's been reasonably new to the field. Barney, I think you've been in two years. So, and, and you had a very interesting entry to this uh, discipline here. Tell, tell us a bit about yourself. How did you, how did you decide on yeah. cybersecurity? How did you decide on pen testing? And give us a bit of background about so your... I, uh, so I was a career changer. I was a, a career musician for 15 years, a guitarist uh, specializing in live session work. Um, I played for sort of live artists and theater shows. Um, and I just decided to change careers really because of the music industry. The, the climate at the time was, was declining and there wasn't enough work. And, um, so I looked into different careers I could do. Um, I was instantly drawn to it, I think because of the flexibility. So with my previous jobs, I, I like to travel a lot. And I wanted to find a profession that I could do like anywhere in the world. I didn't want to, to stay in one place. So um, I actually uh, responded to a campaign by the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, um, which was uh, Fatima's next job could be in cyber. Um, and I actually saw, I saw that advertisement and, and signed up and uh, went on an eight week course, which was fantastic to be honest. It showed all the different um, areas of cybersecurity, including pen testing, um, and uh, governance, risk and compliance, which I think is another area that we maybe haven't spoken about, which I think is also um, quite a popular route into the industry. Um, my first job was actually in a management consultancy um, and pen testing. Although I specialized in pen testing, the pen testing team was actually quite small. Um, and the majority of the team was actually governance, risk and compliance, looking after things like I say 27001 um, and PCI audits, which um, I think is, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a huge part of the field as well. And that was my entry really. Yeah. So beyond the eight weeks then Barney, what other training did you, did you have uh, any, any, any qualifications or any, um, uh, sort of formalized training? Um, so yeah, so I actually joined up to a uh, kind of cyber security bootcamp, which, um, offered, uh, a learning path of various certifications. Um, I did uh, a group of certifications from a company called CompTIA. I did like the A+, plus, then the Network+, plus, Security+, plus, and then finished with the Pentest+. Plus. Um, and when I actually joined um, my first job, it was quite important because a lot of the pen testing jobs that we did were regulated. It was important for me to get um, check status as a check team member. So um, I went on the Crest route, which at the time was uh, um, the Crest Practitioner Security Analyst, which was the first exam, and then the Crest Registered Tester. Um, and that's where I am at the moment. Right. Is that one of the big differences from the early days, Glenn, I guess, that you know you need a badge to wave at organizations to sort of say, yes, I'm you know, everyone trust me to do this. Because in those old days, you could just knock on the door and go, uh, you've got a bit of a problem here, and then see what happened. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. The, there, there weren't certifications when uh, uh, when I got into this in the late late noughties. Um, my, my entry was somewhat haphazard. I, as, as a teenager, I, you know, I tinkered and I tore things apart. And in, in hindsight, it was some, some degree of hacking, you know, tearing apart um, you know, games, demo games, reverse engineering demo games, understanding how the internet works and how I could bypass things. Studied computer science at university just because I was good at computers. It was only at the end of my undergraduate on careers day when um, a company came along called SensePost and gave a presentation and said, hey, do, do you guys want to come work for us? We'll teach you, we'll, 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 we'll let you hack into banks as a, and pay you to do it. This is not a job. What are you? What are you saying? Because every, every other every every, every other um, job placement company was, yeah, come work for us and wear a suit and sit in a cubicle and write Java code. Um, so it was a yeah, slightly different uh, entry path for me. I ended up doing a um, doing an, an internship for them. That's where things kicked off. But yeah, back then there weren't really any or many certifications, and I, I don't think it's a, a good thing or a bad thing either way. It's, it's fantastic that there are so many certifications these days. I think it really lets you know where you are and gives you almost goals to approach and to reach and to understand your own level. Um, but some days, still these days, not everyone does um, certifications. It's useful for some, for some reasons. I think the, the 
the best thing and the most wonderful thing about this career path is you you don't need to do yeah. a degree or a certification or anything. You can jump on YouTube, watch some videos, um, and just tinker and play and learn. If you want to be a doctor, you probably have to go to your um, university <laughs> medical. Well, best not to just do that, Adam, a, I think. <laughs> and just grab a skull yeah. and start playing. But I think with this career path, it's definitely the, the best way to get into this career and the best way to, to get good is just to tinker, to play, to break, to understand and, uh, and tear things apart. And then as a bonus, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it's, so it's are not going to help. So it's are not going to not help. So it's not going to help. And, and Alex, you uh, did a degree and at 18, you knew absolutely that you were going to be a cybersecurity specialist. Is that right? Uh, <laughs> I think 18-year-old me would have been um, a little bit shocked to see where I am now. Yeah, understatement. So I did a, a maths degree, which I absolutely loved. Um, I had no specific career in mind with that. I just genuinely loved maths and yeah, geek space safe zone, I hope here. Um, so I was in my my final year and I knew I didn't want to continue in education, um, but also, yeah, didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I was kind of having conversations with people and Cryptography came up and that, that's interesting, you know, big prime numbers and number theory and interesting things there. And then just kind of a natural extension from those conversations, some people said cybersecurity. And I'll be honest, I, I was really naive, kind of in hindsight, didn't really understand what that meant, but thought, yeah, that sounds quite interesting. Um, so I just kind of took a leap of faith and yeah, I took a job in cybersecurity, really similar to Barney. I did some of the CompTIA exams. I learned what fiber optic cable was and what copper cable was and some really boring stuff that's been a really good foundation for my career, though. And uh, yeah, I had some good mentors that made me do those exams. I wouldn't have probably done them <laughs> without good support. Um, right. But yeah. But did you, can I ask, did you have some, some nope. solid computer science skills? I would have thought maths I had really bad programming no, skills. Really? I'd done work in R and I was really good at data visualization right. and data processing. Uh -huh. But really, I didn't do update my computer. I really had like almost no cybersecurity experience. It was looking back in hindsight, like I'm not really sure how uh -huh. that all happened, but it, it did. Um, huh. So yeah, it, it was just such a huge learning curve in the first place. And I just kind of absorbed so much in that first year it was it was quite an incredible kind of transformation yeah. how about you barney do you have i mean it sounds like you must have had some solid skills because you've gone through a lot of those um, training courses well, previously no no not no real sort of hard computer skills uh we dealt a lot with macintosh computers in, in the music industry so i i have i was computer oh, savvy course. i did have like my own my own sort of recording set up at home um, but yeah, it was really until I started those CompTIA exams that I, I really started to understand how sort of computers work and networks. And... All right. And is there a, a field you're specializing in? Is there something you want to, you could break into? Um, I am really drawn to sort of the infrastructure network. network side of things. Yeah, um, I do want to develop uh, more into sort of web application. Um, I think obviously it's, it's a really uh, emerging field or, or, you know, getting a lot bigger anyway. Um, and and I really want to sort of specialize into sort of that sort of area. Alex, um, what sort of you you've been in the in the industry now for about five or seven years? Yeah, right? five um, years this summer. But five years. So, what sort of um, options are open to someone who uh, who is at your level, because of all the training you've done and the experience that you've had, probably at the at the sharp end, much of it. What what sort of options do you think you would be looking towards uh, over the next couple of years? Yeah, I think one of the things I've kind of um, absorbed with this conversation so far already is like, I guess one of the key points for me is like, there's no cookbook for this. There's no recipe to follow to be a security tester or a security professional. And actually, that's one of the things I like the most about it. So if I'm honest, like, I'm not really too sure. So I've most recently been doing some work which has enabled me to do some team management and team leading. And that's been a new complete learning curve and growth for me. Um, I guess what's really interesting me at the moment is threat led penetration testing and um, kind of emulating threat actors more. Um, so I like the kind of geopolitics of it, how different nation states behave, understanding that behavior and then trying to kind of 
this is a bit grandiose, but you know, in some ways emulate that within my work so that it's more realistic and that what I'm simulating is actually a valid threat as opposed to just because I can. I mean, just because I can is fun, don't, don't get me wrong, but when I'm thinking about what gives value and um, helps make the organizations working with I'm more secure, it helps the organizations I'm working with be more secure, I should say, that threat-led component is really important to me. Because I was curious about the creative side of this, because I, I guess, you know, you mentioned PCI. So some of this must yeah. be fairly standardized and you kind of know what you're going to be testing. But beyond that, is there some, like say that uh, that room for finding a way that other people oh, didn't think of? 100%. That creative, creative. Um, and that's the thing I love the most about offensive security and is what keeps me coming back for more. There's no two jobs the same and the landscape is changing so frequently. You know, it's what you can do on that given day that's not what I delivered last week or what I'll deliver next week. It's in that room with that computer in front of you. What can you do with the tools I have? And I think going back to something else we already talked about, the specialism side, that's why specialisms are important because unfortunately, fortunately, just the nature of life, we the exercises we do are time bound and we need to be able to deliver things efficiently and we need to have the skills in our fingertips rather than a Google away. Now, you know, that doesn't mean that you can't branch off into other work, but um, it's it's a, an efficiency thing, I think. Yeah, uh, to Barney, could I, say, I guess you're finding your feet. You've been in it a couple of years, so I mean, it's the similar kind of thing. You know the standardized bits, and you have those tools at your fingertips. And you're are you are you looking at where you go next with this? Yeah, absolutely, um, definitely. Uh, at the beginning, you know, it's good to sort of uh, branch out into all areas, and then I think just quite naturally, I think everyone sort of finds. Um, a kind of area that in, they enjoy more than others and, and kind of specialise in that one area. I think that's a natural progression for m maybe any job, really. Right. But it, can I ask as well just about pen testers as a tribe, community? I'm not sure what you call them or collective noun is for them. But I, I do you, generally, do people, are, are they contractors or they, you know, like you, Alex, work for a company that offers these kinds of services? I'm just curious about sort of you know, what, you know, how people set themselves up to do this. Yeah, it's a blend for sure. I think um, okay. there, there was some conversations earlier about regulation and, and there is a move more to work with kind of be it Crest registered testers or people who've got certifications in the cyber scheme or whatnot. And you can actually get accreditations as companies as well. So different procurement will have different requirements for that. But lots of people contract as pen testers as well. Um, I think if you go into the kind of more advanced security testing like red teaming and purple teaming, those tend to be individuals that work together frequently really understand each other and their skill sets um, and everybody in that team will be a different specialism to make sure that the kind of branch of requirements for that type of testing is covered yeah i guess you assemble your team and then get to work something uh, i mean in a sense uh, alex you know there are specialisms as well but there is also more in terms of interworking isn't there you know the threat analysts actually work quite closely with the offensive and the uh, 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 and the red team, the the blue team, and there seems to be a lot more coming together of understanding where each of these careers uh, are, are come together, because I think only when you bring that team together actually can you make serious progress with with some of the kind of at, you know sophisticated attacks that we see. Oh, completely, and I think there's a rise more towards what we call purple teaming, which is kind of uh, where you deliver offensive engagements that simulate cyber attacks, but you're doing that with the client fully being aware throughout. And the, the benefit of that is you're working directly with the client's blue team. So they can learn off the, the alerts that you're generating and vice versa. You can see what they've detected on what you've done. That collaboration is immensely valuable. And it never ceases to amaze me how two pieces of, well, the same piece of security software and two organizations detects things differently in a, even weeks apart. <laughs> that always uh, right. baffles yeah. me sometimes the, uh, how nonsensical some of this stuff can be, even though it's all computers. No, I was going to say, because I was wondering if um, doing this job has changed the way you look at the, the world of the web. Just because you know, as a journalist, I see spelling mistakes, I see um, extra spaces in writing all over the place, and just that you're you you you're always on the lookout. You're always checking the text to sort of make sure it's you know it's been proofread properly. I just wonder if you guys are you know if when you go on the web online, you're always thinking, oh, that doesn't look quite right. Or just whether you get really sensitive to those kinds of things, whether it you know does alter your perceptions of it. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's 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 everywhere. It's nonstop. Every every time you sign up for something, and the stuff that bugs me are, are ridiculous password policies. I signed up for something this morning. It was a password requirement policy of you know all I don't know caps and lowercase and special and more than eight but fewer than twenty characters and those types of really outdated, outmoded policies. I I couldn't paste into the password input box. Um, so d- definitely things like that. But at the same time, there's also and I said earlier, hackers are curious. So every every time we see something, you almost have to rein in um, the desire to pick things apart. It's like a like a like a magpie or something. You just want to pick at something and see how it works. So that whatever it is, a, a new app or a new sort of hardware or a, a new new website or you know, I think you know the, the new social media app threads came out today. And the first thought is, oh, I wonder how that works. Yeah, fire up a, a, a proxy and start monitoring the traffic and the. Uh, Tear it, tear it off the inside of the debugger and see how it works. So it's definitely that ongoing curiosity is, is what is what I find, whether it's a job or not. Just how does stuff work? Are you the same, Barney? Are you just curious about sort of want to prod it, prod away it, and see what's um, I think you definitely develop a kind of almost like paranoid mindset <laughs> because definitely since I've been in the field, you know, uh, I even had a, an email recently about a couple of months ago from from a cybersecurity uh, colleague, um, you know sending me his mobile number saying oh I'm, I'm deciding to you know shut down my social media platform you know just contact me here um and obviously you know as a as a sort of cyber security professional you kind of like you know is this real is this really from him <laughs> you certainly take a, a a second look at most things i think okay. but i wanted to ask all three of you what are the things that you find you found really helpful in progressing in your career path i mean glenn um one of the things that Mark and I were speaking uh, earlier is that almost everyone that we've come across, you know, who've been in the industry for a while, they've fallen into cybersecurity, you know, or pen testing. It's not like a planned route. And um, and so, you know, what, we, what we'd like to do is to see what sort of pointers, what sort of helpful, I mean, having mentors maybe uh, is an area, uh, uh, something that helps individuals trying to map a career path. What sort of things have you, each of you found useful? Glenn, starting with you. So you stole, you you stole my answer there, but right, I was going straight for straight for mentors. All right, and I think that's that's the the. I think we can unpick that a bit. So the the concept of a of mentor and, and and why it's useful because the the field it, you know it is slightly uh, unusual and a little bit hard to navigate, and it's, even today it's still a little bit niche um, compared to other properly well long term established. If you, if you want to be an engineer, this is a hundred year. Hundreds of years of uh, of um, you know thought and establishment and whatnot. It's still a fairly newish field, so it can be quite difficult to navigate it, understand it, to know if it's if if it's for you, uh, where you can fit in, um, and, and that kind of thing. I think yeah, the, the idea of having a mentor, either a specific person or a group of people you can go to and just ask questions. Um, and in, in my experience, yeah, I had uh, two two or three very good. Uh, mentors. I'm, I'm not sure in hindsight if they knew they were my mentors, or even if I knew they were mentors at the time. But look, looking back, they kind of guided me and shaped me and excited me about the field when I was still quite new and didn't really understand which which direction to go in, or or, or just the the sheer awesomeness of what you can do and what you can achieve. Um, at the same time, I think it's still kind of in the mentor category. But working, I think, especially in, in your early days, working for a well respected. Um, very very good pen test firm or security firm. I think I'm, I'm a bit later in my career now. I I, I work for myself and I'm I'm quite happy with that arrangement. But earlier on, that wouldn't have worked for me. Like I, I worked for a very good pen test firm. It was called SensePost back then. It's Orange Cyber Defense now. But they they really had this uh, incredible tenacity and hunger for security. And it was you, know, you the the thought back then was you 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 lived and you breathed security and you everyone would push each other to. You know, to their best possible limits. Um, whereas, if we're left to our own devices, um, maybe I don't, I don't think we necessarily get lazy, but maybe we're less motivated or less curious or less um, enthralled. So, for example, I, I one one of my favorite things I do now is uh, public speaking events. That's a probably twenty thirty percent of of my kind of job is speaking at conferences or events. That's how Barat and I met. That's how I make all these kind of contacts. Um, I really wanted to do that. But I was really like public speaking was my worst day at school. I had to give a speech in front of just my friends. And I still have nightmares about that. But when I when I got on this journey, I'm like, oh black hat and DefCon, that's so cool, man. I'd love to do that one day. I'm so scared. I remember chatting to uh, some friends, my first pen test job. Like, well, you know, just just 
find a conference you like and write an abstract and submit it. But I haven't done the research yet. And I just, just submit it. That will give you the motivation to actually do the work. And we'll be here and we'll support you. Um, and that, for me, was a, a wonderful experience. And, and it got me onto that kind of track. And I don't think we, we mentioned this earlier on different career paths. You know, definitely conferences and public speaking and uh, research and development, giving back to the community is definitely a big part of, of pen testing, security, ethical hacking, and whatnot. Um, I think having those people around you who can lift you up, that makes the biggest impact early in your career is my, uh, my short answer. Barney, uh, any thoughts in terms of uh, what's helped you so far? Definitely mentorship is, has been uh, a, a massive one. I think most organizations now do realize that and both jobs that I've um, had in cybersecurity have assigned me a mentor um, that I can you know, ask questions to and, and learn from. Um, and I think if you're, you know, transitioning into cybersecurity, I think don't be afraid to to ask because I think um, the community is really, really friendly. It's really helpful. I've definitely found that. I've sort of just um, blindly messaged people going, you know, I'm new to this. You know, would you be up for, you know, a call and, and chatting about it? And and on on the whole, most people have, have been really receptive of, of that. And um, I've had great responses from people. Yeah, cool. And just to chip in there, even, even later in the career, so I'm seemingly the, the well-established person on, on this call, but I'm still new in so many fields. I was recently exploring some stuff I had no idea about. I yeah, reach out to someone who's probably 15 years younger than me, but they're, they're an expert in it, and that's, that's no problem. You know, the, as, as Barney says, the, the community is very welcoming, and it's a, I think a strong ethos of the hacker community is to share knowledge that goes right back to the roots, back to the, back to the 60s where the word you know, hacker originally came from. Back then, it's all about knowledge sharing and lifting each other up. And that's still, uh, that still is very much the case. Alex, I assume that in your organization, you actually have a formal mentoring program and presumably you're a mentor to other youngsters. Yeah, which is kind of crazy. It's, uh, it, well, it feels like that to me. Maybe I shouldn't say that out loud in a podcast, but <laughs> I think for me, the, the big thing is, is trust and opportunity. I look back at the trust and opportunity I was given five years ago. And in hindsight, it feels kind of shocking. Um, but then I realized that actually it's about the attributes that you have as a person and the knowledge can be acquired. And I think if you trust in a person that they have the right attitude, the right ability to learn, then giving them that scope with the relevant safety nets, but trusting them to go and learn and do something interesting. And I'm, you know, it's actually really, really fruitful now to see people who um, you know, you give that scope to, and then they come back and do something better than you could have done some totally different tangent that you never would have explored. And that's, that's really rewarding. Um, so yeah, it's, I think like allowing, allowing people the space to, to explore something new, even if you're not sure that they're quite there yet. I would definitely second that. I remember my first ever engagement when I was, it was like my second week being an intern. And I was given my own, like the first week, I kind of proved myself or something, just got settled in the second week. I was given my own engagement with a very large financial organization and just said, hey, Glenn, get your target. You've got two weeks, go have fun. And I was simultaneously excited and terrified. It's like, well, who, who should I report to? And do I need to check before I do anything? It's like, no, we trust you, go for it. Um, I think in hindsight, their, their level of trust really kind of built on my own confidence and uh, yeah, it turned out uh, I, uh, I tore that organization to shreds, which was uh, a good start in my career, I think. Yeah, good place to be. Interesting. I, I just wonder if we can speculate a bit about sort of where things might go, because obviously we've given people a good idea of sort of where it started. And it's got obviously a bit more formalized. There's, you know, there's some particular things that organizations ask you to do. But because I saw the other day something emerging called Pentest GPT mm -hmm. and someone trying to automate all this. So I just wonder, is, is, is that, does that worry you guys that there's, some aspects of this that are going to be put under that or, or yeah, just, I don't, um, Alex, for, for yourself, I don't know if there's a lot of automated tools you use out there that and you just, those are going to grow and how it's changing in that respect. Yeah, they certainly are growing and there's definitely kind of more automated pen testing um, going on. I think pen testing is moving in that direction and more of the kind of scenario based testing or testing where we're not just looking at the technology, but we're looking at the people and processes and how those interact together. That's not something right. I see even remotely in the future being emulated by a computer. But yeah, any aid that I can get to improve the efficiency, the reach that I have in my in my testing, I, I think is is great. I think there will also be a move to kind of 
adversarial AI, you know, manipulating data sent to learning models to see how that manipulates the outcome of them. Uh, I think there's lots of really interesting research going on in that space. And I'm sure there's a whole load of kind of niche people specializing in that even already. So that's something that's super interesting. Um, and then I also think like the kind of geopolitical sense, there's lots more openness around kind of national cybersecurity strategies nation states coming out and publicly declaring their status in, in cyberspace, what they want to do, their aims. Um, so I think that will inevitably seep into the, the security testing community and it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. How about you, Bonnie? There's lots to catch up with, keep up with as well. Because that strikes me as about, you know, as Glenn said, it's, it's, or you're always learning. But I just wonder, yeah, you, you, I guess you have to adjust all the time to... to to, to match yeah, that. absolutely. I mean, obviously, I mean, I've only been assessing for a couple of years, but I'm definitely seeing uh, a rapid change in the attack surface of businesses. I think, um, I guess that's been driven um, by the equally rapid adoption of like cloud services. So, um, what traditionally used to be physical infrastructure, I guess, has now been replaced with um, uh, the flexibility and maybe sometimes convenience of of, of virtualization. Um, but I guess. Uh, a lot of the, of the problems that I'm seeing is that businesses sometimes have a hard task of um, keeping track of everything that um, they own. So that's true. Um, it's quite easy now for a developer to sort of spin up a, a virtualized instance in the clouds to kind of test their code, but then sometimes forget it, uh, forget to take it down again. So um, I think that's been see a lot yeah. of those for sure. Yeah. yeah. So one thing I did as a journalist was scrape through AWS buckets. That was fun. This <laughs> was, I turned up lots of interesting things there. How about you, Glenn? I don't know about yourself. You, you said you you're always improving your skills as well. But I, yeah, is it? Are you worried about that automation side of things? Not going to put anybody out of a job, particularly. It's it's, it's a good question, and um, it definitely is a flurry of um, AI. Should you call it excitement or hype or something? Now it's definitely going to shake things up. But I think it's still pretty much um, business as usual for the foreseeable future. Um, yeah, there's lots of stories about uh, chat GPT helping you write malware and things like that. There's nothing that you couldn't learn from a, a Google query or, or, or reading a blog. Maybe it's very slightly more accessible. Um, and you know, maybe for, for phishing campaigns, so, um, I'm not sure if, you, if you're familiar with the, the GoFish project, open source uh, phishing platforms. I, I maintain that project now. I didn't create it, but I, I maintain it now. And I added a Go, uh, I, I added a, a chat GPT module to it. So you can just click create template, click create email. Yeah. Um, click create web page, etc. Yeah, slightly convenient, maybe. Uh, who knows? I think it might it might shake things up more so on the side that Alex mentioned, maybe uh, data modeling and uh, interpreting massive amounts of data, um, essentially uh, emulating an analyst. Possibly, he has ten thousand uh, IOCs. Um, in uh, in the case of compromise, please go through them and tell me anything that seems a little bit odd. You know, maybe it's easier to ask a bot than to go and write an R query an R query or something. Maybe um, slightly devil's advocate, something I always try and keep in mind is how useful we are as pen testers and as an industry. Um, Harun Mir gave an excellent talk about 10 years ago now called um, is, is pen testing considered harmful? And one of the things he, he brought up was the idea that we need, we need to be mindful as an industry that we're not, that pen testers aren't just emulating other pen testers because we go and we do a pen test and oh, we found these things, okay, we fix these things, come and again, do another pen test. But we, we're just acting like other pen testers because those are things that pen testers would find as opposed to real world problems and threats that hackers would actually go go and target. So that's something that I am always quite mindful of because the, the industry is huge and there's a lot of money and there's a lot of activity and people and things going on. Um, but I'm always mindful of, oh, are we actually doing good? Like, Let's make sure that we're actually contributing to security and making things better in, in one way or or another, but just keeping an eye on ourselves because you sometimes I find we're in our own little bubble. Um, and maybe sometimes we need external stakeholders or external points of view or just a reality check to make sure that we are on a um, the, the the noble path. Yeah, we find that with ISF members, a lot of them obviously you know, have a lot of regulator responsibilities and they do tick a lot of boxes. And sometimes I get the impression that you know, a lot that's all that some people do. I think I actually drilled down into well, what does that mean for our organization? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It gives you an absolute the 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 risk that I find is gives you an absolute false sense of security. Okay, we had a pen test done. 
they said we're good, so we're good. It's like no, you're you're safe against pen testers. Um, it's like having antivirus, but antivirus is outdated. It's like oh, the AV, I'm safe, so I can click this link. Your your AV is outdated, and um, anyway, any any hacker with assault can bypass any any antivirus uh, software. So often, I find for an engagement, if an organization is using antivirus, it's almost easier to get someone to click a link or to download a file or to do something because. They have a false sense of security. I've got AV. That's fine. I'll click the links and download the things. A AV would tell me if this, if this was bad. Um, and I find sometimes in the industry, we sometimes prop, um, maybe uh, perpetuate that with, uh, with with the approaches taken to pen tests, especially when it's more like check checkbox pen testing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, th I think threat modeling is excellent. We should definitely do that, but just be a bit wary of um, yeah, just kind of. Tick boxing and certifying right this this organization yeah, I, is I safe. I think that even extends to red teaming. I completely agree. Um, you know, just because you've had adversary emulation and somebody's come in and tested whether a scenario is is feasible or not, that doesn't mean that tomorrow it's not going to be feasible when there's a new zero day or, you know, a, an organization spent a large amount of time researching your staff or, or whatever it is. It's it's uh, there's very little certainty gained, and I think it's agreed really important to highlight the gaps in the coverage and also just kind of uh, how, how gray some of this stuff often is. Yeah, because certainly one of the best customers yeah, and security tools is the bad guys. When they they have all the tools, they yeah, run them all. I've, they, I've been involved yeah, in campus. Yeah, they you know, find all the loopholes and that's, sometimes that's how they get in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been involved in pen tests where I, I come in straight after another vendor and they've got a green report, A plus security, everything's fine. And I, I break in within five minutes <laughs> just because fresh mindset, different approach. Yeah. Um, it's not to say I'm an amazing hacker. It could be the other way around. I did a test. I said everything's fine. Another firm comes in. Hey, Presto, they they break in. So yeah. um, a pen test doesn't mean that you're secure. It means that you're secure against the things that yeah. the tester tested against. Yeah. Um, I, I think a good mindset for any organization is to assume that you are breached. Yeah, absolutely. Assume you're compromised and take um, actions in the way you, you you handle your data. That's the, that's the whole idea. But behind um, behind zero trust, just assume everything is breached and everything is is, is, is dirty and contaminated um, yeah. and that's that's probably quite a, a useful way to approach things yeah. I just do um, round these up All right, any more questions I think we've given people a pretty good idea but I want to show yeah. if there's anything you wanted to round just up just maybe on. one more you know we started off with saying that you know there is a, a skills gap issue is this still uh, an issue you know <laughs> are we still in need for skills in this particular segment in a speci specific discipline and are we making it attractive you know are the salaries attractive uh do we address the diversity inclusion sort of issues what do you think in terms of the industry yeah. difficult question yeah, no one wants to answer that Barney are you yeah. making more money as doing this than you were as a musician I don't know difficult question you answer but yeah is it is it a good place it's, to be yeah it is a difficult question to answer I mean I actually took a pay cut when I took my first role in pen testing um quite significant about probably about 10 grand I, I took a 10 grand pay cut for my first role so I think there's definitely you know you, you have to be expected to do that I think within the industry um when you start out especially um I think there is obviously an amazing career progression and you can you know the earning potential can get you know enormous but I think you've got to be realistic if you're if you're already established in, in one profession and, and then moving to a new profession you are going to be new you know you're going to be um fighting for jobs along with graduates so you can expect sort of you know that sort of salary um yeah i think that there is probably a long way to go with like diversity and inclusion i think um definitely from what i've seen uh, within the industry um but um i think i think it's definitely on the agenda for most organizations and hopefully um you know most people are, are, are addressing those 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 issues that we face yes i think um Definitely, uh, uh, I'm sorry if you have other answers, but yeah, definitely agree. I, I, I think getting getting in, you can definitely take a pay cut, but I've seen a lot of people come from an established job to you know, sort of into pen testing. And if, if you're not motivated by the money, you'll end up making a lot of money. Um, if, if you want to get into security for the money, you probably won't make that much. But if you're just passionate and, and I, I'm going to stop being a banker or whatever, I want to be a hacker, and you're really enthusiastic, passionate, and get stuck into it, yeah, you'll take an initial pay cut. I've seen that enthusiasm pay off big dividends in the long run. I totally yeah. agree. So do you all call yourselves hackers? Is is that a thing? Is that a your badge wearing hackers? I thing? don't really use the word hacker actually, and I really kind of no right? appreciate the recent move by the Security Council to security tester. 
when I tell people I'm a penetration tester, worst I tell them I'm a Crest registered penetration tester, that usually prompts laughs for people who are not in cybersecurity industry. I think it's actually a really good yeah. move for kind of from an inclusion diversity perspective to move towards the security tester label. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, and they've yeah. They accommodated vulnerability testing and other areas, um, similar areas to that. So that makes sense. Yes, because that's been very useful. Um, Glenn, um, Alex, I think that's sort of excellent in insights into this area. And Barney, you know, a wonderful um, mapping of your musical career onto pen testing. <laughs> and yeah. Just to round up then, just one final um, comment quickly from all of you. Just, I, I suspect I know the answer to this, but would you recommend security testing as a career? And if there's one thing someone should do if they want to get in it, what should they do? So starting with you, Barney, if, you know, which I guess you would recommend it, but if, you know, if someone wants to get started, what should they do? Yeah, I mean, I, I would absolutely recommend that. I think it definitely suits people who enjoy solving puzzles. Um, um, I think that's 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 definitely one of the the key aspects. If you've got like a curious, inquisitive nature, uh, this this is definitely the profession for you. Um, and um, I think if you want to get more information, I think there's plenty of uh, websites out there that actually can train sort of technical skills, such as try hack me um have have a great website that you can sort of it guides you through different uh, rooms that you can complete um and gives you a flavor of what penetration testing is all about um and then there's hack the box which is it's slightly more advanced but you can um go on to those as well actually thank you alex i guess you'd recommend yeah it. yeah one thing that people yeah, should do. definitely would recommend i think for me it's about getting that solid technical foundation i'm really thankful to the people that forced me to do that in the beginning uh reticently but i now try and encourage others to do the same because i think it pays off yeah. dividends later down the line um and it, it's impossible to really kind of unpick things if you don't properly understand them so yeah doing some sort of really basic networking and, and security exams would be my suggestion so thanks and glenn i guess you would recommend it as well but yeah 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 that's uh uh, maybe it's not for everyone, but it's definitely for us on the call and for those hopefully listening. It's, it's definitely a, a very fun, very rewarding um, career path. And as, as you progress, there's a lot of different options that you can go into. So if you want to start with the, the actual, um, I want to say pen testing now, what did we security say? Test. So, um, security oh, no, sorry, second. I didn't mean to. <laughs> um, no, 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 I'm using, I'm using, yeah, the, uh, the, the break into things, side of things, and then maybe you progress elsewhere. So for, for me, it was definitely... Um, a younger person's game. I don't do that much pen testing anymore. Um, I think uh, this is the energy of youth, maybe. Um, but definitely, there's some older older pen testers who are in their fifties and still still breaking stuff. I think the the best advice for me, if this kind of uh, career path interests you, is just to tinker. It's so easy these days. Start, you know, set up, uh, you know, um, download whatever virtual machine software you want, VirtualBox or something. Set up an entire virtual lab, Windows boxes, Linux boxes, create a whole Windows domain. Um, create an entire organization and just get tinkering how does stuff work how does authentication work put up a website and just break stuff like it's not a good idea to go and hack you know real websites you know if it's try hacking or something that's fine but don't uh, don't cut your teeth breaking in real stuff create your own environment and get stuck in there and also I'd really encourage people to build more build more tools um, the kind of curiosity of tink get tinkering but also building little utilities little tools research projects that kind of thing I think there's there's so much opportunity there, and that's a space that's really uh, that's really untapped. So I'd really encourage listeners to um to yeah, have have that mindset. Hackers are awesome builders, and definitely go and explore that avenue. Yeah, just have a, get out there, have a go. Thank you, everybody, and uh, thanks Barrett, for setting this up. This has been fab. I've learned a lot, and I think I'm more convinced that I should have been a pen tester earlier on as well. Uh, thanks to everyone for listening. Tell your friends. Uh, you can now find ISF podcasts on all major podcast platforms. If you look at the show notes for our page on Audio Boom. You can subscribe to make sure you don't miss an episode and who'd want to do that. Uh, the podcasts are also available uh, at securityforum.org where you can also learn more about ISF research tools and words.